Today, scientists say there are about 200 billion trillion stars in the observable universe and two trillion planets. When the Pew Research Center asked Americans, do you believe that we are alone in the universe? About two thirds or 65% said no. They believe that intelligent life exists on other planets. And amazingly, 76% of adults under age 30 agreed with them. Polls also showed that 41% of Americans believe UFOs, popularly known as unidentified flying objects, are evidence that alien life from other planets has come to Earth. Moreover, 16% of people claimed first-hand sightings of UFOs. Even Congress and high-profile Pentagon officials are interested in UFOs. In 2022, they officially broadened the name of UFOs to UAPs, or Unidentified Anomalous Phenomena, so they could document unidentified craft maneuvering between air, space, or through the sea. As followers of Christ, how do we make sense of millions of reports of UFO phenomena from around the world? Does the potential presence of extraterrestrial life and reports of alien abductions of people challenge the foundations of biblical teaching? Or might UFO phenomenon serve as one of the most compelling present-day proofs that a biblical understanding of reality is indeed accurate? This series is about UFO and alien abductions. My guest is astronomer and astrophysicist, Dr. Hugh Ross, who obtained his Bachelor of Science degree in physics from the University of British Columbia, his PhD in astronomy from the University of Toronto, and for five years did postdoctoral research at Caltech on quasars and galaxies. Join us for this special series you will see only on The John Ankerberg Show. Welcome to our program. I'm John Ankerberg, and my guest today is astronomer and astrophysicist Dr. Hugh Ross. And uh, I'm so glad that you're here, Hugh. And right behind you, you see uh, a galaxy full of stars. And I want to ask you a question. How many stars are there in the universe? Oh, about 10 trillion trillion. Some of the atheists would say, you know, if God is the creator and he created everything, he uh, wasted a lot of time on all of these stars. Do we need all of these stars? Well, we need the universe to be precisely the mass that it is to get the elements that are essential for life. And so if you make the universe the tiniest bit less massive, then the only elements that stars will be able to produce uh, would be helium from the primordial hydrogen. You only have helium, hydrogen, and a tiny amount of lithium. Make the universe slightly more massive than what it is, then the stars will be, have so much helium in them that they'll quickly fuse all the material in the universe to elements heavier than manganese or heavier. In both cases, you have a universe with no carbon, no oxygen, no nitrogen, and no possibility for life. The mass of the universe has to be exquisitely fine-tuned. How many galaxies are there in the universe? Well, the James Webb Space Telescope is telling us we're dealing with about two trillion uh, medium, large, and giant galaxies. And do we need all of those? We need every bit of the universe. And keep in mind, all that stuff we see, that's only a quarter percent of the total stuff of the universe. What's the age of the universe? 13.79 billion years. How long do stars burn? Well, the really big stars burn up in a few hundred thousand years. Uh, stars that are tinier than the sun can take as long as a trillion years to burn up. What's the age of the Earth? 4.5662 billion years. I love you having these decimal points here. Let's take you to the sun. We take the sun for granted all the time, and it's so important. Uh, just uh, give me an idea, first of all. Give me the uh, 
the diameter right straight across from one side to the other, what's the diameter in miles of how big is the sun? It's about 865,000 miles in diameter. Let's give another way of saying how big the sun is. If we were to take Earth, and we had a bunch of Earths, how many Earths would it take to fill up the sun? 1.3 million. That gives you an idea of how big the and sun is. And the sun is. is not the biggest star. There are stars that are way bigger than the sun. Yeah, ours is medium size, basically. It's yes. uh, almost a small one. And uh, yet, uh, there's something very interesting about the sun. If it was any closer, we'd all burn up. If it was any further away, we would all be frozen. And it's just right. And it took it a while for God to get it to the spot where he could bring humans on the scene. And uh, tell us how he did that. Well, you create bacteria. I mean, God created 3.8 billion years ago a vast quantity of diverse microbes, and they began to chemically transform both the atmosphere and the chemistry of the surface of the Earth. And for three billion years of microbial activity, the planet was now ready for plants and animals, but it took a certain quantity of oxygen in the atmosphere for we human beings to be able to exist. Uh, God also recognized that the sun that we orbit is the stablest of all stars, but it doesn't reach maximum stability until it burns up half of its nuclear fuel. That takes four and a half billion years. So we humans are existing in the narrow time window in the history of the sun and the earth in which we can thrive and have global civilization. Interesting. Got another question for you because the number one cause of people that take uh, a poll, uh, whether it's a Gallup poll or any other kind of poll, is that 50% or more of Americans, and especially more than Europeans in France and uh, South Americans in Brazil, the fact is they would say that uh, UFOs and uh, extraterrestrials, that they came from a faraway planet and they came to our Earth, and that's why we're seeing UFOs and extraterrestrials. But I got a question for you to, before we answer that one and it leads into it, and that is, first of all, how fast is the speed of light? 186,000 miles per second. And so God's put a speed limit on the universe. You can't go any faster than 186,000 miles per second. And I wanted an illustration of how fast that is. So here's my illustration. If I came into the room and all I said was, hello, that's all. The speed of light, starting when I said hello, going around the middle of the earth and coming back to that spot. By the time I said hello, it would have gone around the earth seven and a half times. Right. That's pretty fast. Now, the reason I bring that up is that our spacecraft are realizing we can't go like Captain Kirk, and we couldn't go Mac 1, Mac 2, and so on. You can only go probably at 1% of the speed of light. Why? Well, it's E equals MC squared, basically saying the faster you travel, uh, the more damage your ship will take from protons, neutrons, particles, dust, uh, that's in interstellar space. And so if you double the velocity, the damage goes up by a factor of four times. Now, one way you can mitigate that is make your spaceship smaller. The bigger the spaceship, the more impacts it's going to take. And astronomers have already determined the biggest spaceship we can send even to the nearest planetary system cannot be larger than 10 centimeters across. Which is 3.9 inches long. Yeah, it's just this, this size. <laughs> so uh, you're not even going to send a termite across interstellar space let alone these uh, beings that you see on posters in Roswell, New Mexico. And how long would the termite take to get there? Mm -hmm. Well, if you're going at 1% the velocity of light, to get to the nearest planetary system, uh, that would take 42 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and people who search for extraterrestrial intelligent life, they've already ruled out all planets within 250 light years of the Earth. Now we're talking 25,000 years. Uh, to make one trip. Yeah, 
and for them to get the information back to us, how long would it take for them to get the information back to us via sound? Well, if you're talking 250 light years away, it takes 250 years to send a signal uh, back. So astronomers actually want to go to the nearest planet outside our solar system. They're talking 42 years to get there, another 4.2 years to send some information back. It's a 50-year project. Hollywood's gotten into this, and Steven Spielberg had uh, E.T., uh, please phone home. And I had the question of how far away was home? And the thing is, you astronomers, with your telescopes, you have examined how many planets out there as far as you can see? Well, the list today stands at 5,600 planets that have been discovered outside of our solar system. None of them are candidates for advanced life. Why? Well, they're orbiting the wrong star. Uh, they do not meet the habitability requirements. One of the problems is that people hear that there's 40 billion habitable planets in the Milky Way galaxy. That's based on the assumption that the only habitability requirement is a planet have liquid water on its surface. We know of 13 other habitability requirements. The only planet we know that exists in even three of those habitable zones is the one we're sitting on, the same one that exists in all 14. Yeah, it's so much fun talking to you about science, but uh, let's jump to uh, the main topic today, which is that uh, you and I have both had experiences with UFOs and uh, extraterrestrial events that have happened here on Earth. And I'd like to start with a very simple story about a young couple that uh, you knew and they bought a house from somebody and you tell the story. Yeah, it's a young couple in our church. They bought this home and after they'd been in the home for a couple of days, they gave me a phone call and said, one of the rooms in the house is much colder than the rest of the house. And we also saw items floating in midair. Uh, so we think that the previous owners must have had a relationship with a demon and weird things are happening. And we've searched the whole house trying to find all cold articles we need to get rid of. They got rid of some, but they said, it's still there. Can you come over? Let's have a prayer time and see if we can find out uh, what's causing the demon to remain. And so I went over there, we prayed for uh, quite a few minutes, and uh, I said, where have you looked? They looked all over the house. I said, well, backyard, yes. Uh, the garage, yes. The attic, yes. And I says, well, let's go into the garage. And they said, we've looked everywhere. And I said, well, what about that pile of junk lumber on the rafters in the garage? And they said, we've not looked there. Well, let's haul that down and see what we can find. And I knew what to look for, because in the room where weird things were happening, I could see a faint octagonal outline about three feet in diameter. I said, we need to find that item. Well, it turned out it was in that pile of lumber in the rafters of the garage. It was an astrological forecaster. We destroyed the forecaster. The temperature of the room went back to normal. Right away. No more floating articles in the room. Everything was fine. The demon was gone. Tell me about the fact that uh, you astronomers, the best time to see the stars is about 3 o'clock to uh, four or five o'clock in the morning on a lonely road out in the country away from city lights. Well, what's going on there, John, is that people who study UFOs, the most common location and time for a UFO encounter is uh, two or three a.m. in the morning on a lonely country road. Well, that's where we astronomers hang out. But it was the astronomer Peter Sturrock who did a survey of astronomers and said, how many of you have had these encounters? The statistics were extremely low. And it was like, if, if this was just something natural going on, not supernatural, you'd expect that astronomers would have the highest number of experiences with UFOs. They got one of the lowest. And so that's more evidence for dealing with something beyond uh, the physics of this universe. I want to ask you about the fact that uh you have done the incredible all through your career for years. I don't know how many years you've done this, but you spend 1,500 hours a year looking through some of the hugest telescopes that we've got in America and around the world. 
15, 1,500 hours. And you're looking at the sky, and I'm saying, what are you looking at for 1,500 hours? How many years have you been doing this? Well, that's when I was doing professional astronomy at Caltech and the University of Toronto. So that went on for, uh, oh, about a 10-year period uh, where I was logging that kind of telescope time. Um, and yeah, I was mainly studying quasars and galaxies during that period. All right. Now, all of that time that you were looking at space through some of our largest telescopes, you never saw a UFO or an extraterrestrial. I've had no UFO encounters in my entire life. But you had a couple of students that came and used the same telescope for just a few hours. How many hours were they there? It was a couple of astronomers from another university. And uh, yeah, they would get about three or four hours on the telescope per year every time they saw a UFO when they were on the telescope. Every time? Every time. But I knew that they were deeply involved in the occult. I wasn't. Other astronomers were logging a thousand plus hours. They were not. And so there again, it kind of emphasizes the point that you see in the Bible. This only happens to people that are involved in the occult who have given invitations uh, for these spirit beings to invade their life. Yeah. Give me another illustration. In our church, there was this neighborhood that was filled with witchcraft covens. And uh, we had a woman escape from one of those covens. And so we paid a return visit. So I was in this coven. Uh, there were about 10 ladies there, plus this male warlock, uh, male witch. And he had complete control over these women. And he basically boasted, hey, I got the entire New Testament memorized backwards and forwards. Give me a verse. I'll recite it to you backwards and forwards. I said, I believe you. He also said, see that girl out in the street? I can make her do a cartwheel anytime I want. I says, look, I've read the Bible. I know demons have the power to perform miracles. Tell you what, though, pick any verse out of the New Testament and tell me what it means. He was not able to do that. I mean, so, and that kind of opened up the eyes of the women that were there saying, hey, he bragged that he was all powerful. He's not that powerful. They were able to escape his clutch. But we also had days of prayer and fasting where I would gather together uh, 12 to 15 uh, people and we would spend an entire day praying and fasting about asking the Holy Spirit to take that out of our city. And uh, within a few weeks, all the witchcraft covens were gone. Uh, I remember another incident where a gentleman showed up at our church, clearly demon possessed, and uh, we cast the demon out. However, we forgot to ask him for permission. And so he was clean for about two weeks. Then later, there were even more demons in him. And so it taught us a lesson. When someone is demon-possessed, you need to ask him, do you want to be set free? And people who are demon-possessed, they're under great fear. The demons threaten them. And so because of that fear, often they don't want to be helped. Uh, or they like the power that they're getting uh, from the demon. So it's always important to say, hey, do you want to be free? And if they say yes, then cast the demon out. Yeah, I was in Zimbabwe preaching. It's right next to the parliament. I had a huge crowd. And when I gave the invitation, lots of people came forward. And one guy somehow got up to me. And uh, he was demon possessed. And there were some men that came and tried to have him sit down on the ground. And these were huge guys, two, 300 pound guys. They could not get him to sit down on the ground. I came over and I said, we need to pray for him. But then I noticed in his hand, he had an idol. And I said, I need the idol. I took the idol. The idol had a little bowl on it had the idol, and the idol was holding the bowl, and the bowl had blood on it. Hmm. And I said, give me that. He gave that to me. I started going away. The guy started to pray for him. And there were six guys, and this guy only weighed 110 pounds. 
And all of a sudden, he jumped up. Six guys holding him. And then he went straight down to the ground. And I took that idol away and broke it up and into all kinds of pieces. So in terms of what you're talking about, I realize unless they're willing to give up the very thing that they're serving, the things, the demons will come back into the person and it can be worse than it, it can was be worse, at, yes. at the front. Now, we're telling these stories because it's happening all over the world. We're doing audio Bibles that we're giving to people and we're over 17 million people in listening groups and people that are having demonic experiences, they put a Bible that just starts to play and the demons start to scream. They hate listening to the Bible and they lock the person in the room and they keep the Bible playing and in about a day or two, all of a sudden the demon leaves because they hate listening to the Word of God. So you've got to know the Word of God but for people that are listening to us right now, here in America, as well as around the world, there's a lot of dreams. I think one of the biggest things I've seen is people that get involved with this, they cannot sleep at night because they have the worst dreams that you've ever had. And one of the dreams that has been given to, to a lot of these people is the fact that there's going to be an atomic war coming up and there's going to be complete destruction around the world, but they're going to somehow be left. And this demon is going to come and save them and say, take them to a safe place. Or they will have the fact of you have a nuclear, I got a 400 page book of all of our nuclear bases in the United States where they've seen UFOs that have come across them. So they're saying, why have they done that? And they've come to the conclusion that they're holding us back from hold, pulling the trigger so you don't have nuclear chaos. And these demons are telling the people, we are here to save you. Well, you're bringing up something important. If you're having recurring, terrifying nightmares and you're afraid to go to sleep at night, that's an indication there's something occultic Absolutely. that's giving permission for these demons to torment you to that degree find out what that occultic connection is. And you might be completely clean of the occult, but it might be a father or a grandfather. And we're told in the Bible is confess the sins of your parents, of your close relatives. Agree with God that what they're doing is against his will. That cuts the link. That will stop you from having these encounters. We're working with this in 85 different nations in 253 different languages and dreams is one of the biggest things that we're hearing. People are having horrible dreams and they can't sleep. And when they finally invite Jesus Christ to come into their life, they can lay down and they have complete peace and they can sleep. And they are so excited about it. They say, I've got to tell my mother about this. I've got to tell my father. I've got to go to the next village and tell my brothers and sisters. I've got to tell my friends in the other village. They become the best evangelists because they've got peace in their life. They've been set free. They've been separated from their dreams. Yeah. And I'm saying that the power of Christ is amazing. And unfortunately, we in the church today here in America and in some places in the world, we are not telling people that some of the ills that they've got is because they have opened the door through games, through the videos, through the things they're watching, through pornography, the fact that they've opened the door so that demons have come in and the fact is they are in trouble physically because of that and they need to bring it to the Lord and say, Lord, I was wrong, I repent, I'm going to leave that, I'm not going back to it, I'm going to serve you forever, you're my Lord and Savior, forgive me of my sin and they get peace. And I want people to know that, that they can have that. That's the great news of Jesus Christ. What else would you add? Well, also make sure that, uh, you know, you might be clean, but if you've got a close relative that's involved in the occult, uh, agree with God in prayer that what they're doing displeases you've got an him. an illustration. Well, I know an individual who's having these recurring, terrifying nightmares. And, uh, you know, they didn't know what to do. They've been reading the Bible and they said, look, there's no occult in my life. 
Uh, and I said, well, uh, who are you having a relationship with? And he says, well, I mean, I've got a girlfriend. I says, well, are you sleeping with her? Well, yes. Well, what's she like? Well, she happens to be a witch. And I says, well, there's your connection. You need to break that relationship. And when he did, the dreams went away. Yeah. Folks, I'm so glad that you've joined us this week. And uh, I hope that you'll stay tuned because I have a very important personal word for you in just a moment. Thanks for joining us today. Jesus said he came to seek and to save those who are lost. He says it was because God so loved the world. He loved you so much that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. You see, Jesus came into this world to pay for your sins. He died on the cross and rose again so that you can be completely forgiven and spend eternity with him. This isn't something you can earn through your own good works. He offers it to you as a free gift, which you can receive through putting your faith in him. If you'd like to do this right now by asking Jesus to be your savior, I invite you to join me in this simple prayer. Just say, Dear God, thank you for loving me. I know I am a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness right now. I believe Jesus is your son and that he died for all my sins on the cross. I also believe that you raised him from the dead. Right now, I want to trust him as my savior and follow him as my Lord from this day forward. Please give me the strength to live for you. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, folks, one day I said a prayer just like that. And if you prayed this today, I want you to know what God promises to do for you. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. That's you if you just prayed this prayer. And if you did, I want you to see what God says he will do. He says, shall be saved. That's what God does. He promises to save you. Now, if you would like to watch more programs from The John Ankerberg Show again, or share it with a friend, you can do so for free on your phone through our app. Just go to the App Store on your device and search for Ankerberg. Once you download it, you can watch this series again, as well as over a hundred other programs, anytime, anywhere, absolutely free. To find these videos in your language, simply open up our app and tap on the languages. Thanks again for joining us today. I hope you tune in this time next week for another episode of The John Ankerberg Show. Until then, God bless, and I'll see you next week.